As we talked about, Ron is giving you some very practical advice. And one of the things that, that strikes me is his ability to uh, communicate um, how to win. So we know that we have the right philosophy. We know we have the right ideas. Uh, but our, our real challenge now is to make those ideas attractive to other people. And politics is the downstream of the culture. It's the downstream of, of what leaders are talking about. And so when I see that conservatives aren't in charge, I instantly identify that we don't have the right leaders uh, to make conservatism uh, an attractive uh, governing philosophy. Uh, so I want to talk about that in terms of the communications uh, strategy uh, today. And so we're going to we're going to we're going to talk. You can just go to the next slide. Thank you. So the first the first thing leaders have to do is they have to have a vision. Uh, Proverbs from the, from the Old Testament tells us that without a, a vision, the, the people perish. And most people are not visionaries. And we have to understand that the voters that we're speaking with are, in general, not vi visionaries. We need our leaders to be visionaries. Leaders need to be able to, to describe a positive future for the voters uh, that is powerful enough that they want that, despite what the opposition will say about it. Yeah, yeah, I know the conservatives are terrible, terrible people. That's what I've heard all my life. But I want that thing that he's talking about. I want freedom. I want less regulation. I want lower taxes. I want the ability to create a business. I want the ability to determine uh, my own future. I want a better education uh, that's affordable for my children. I want better health care. I want a secure retirement. All of these things are values that, that people care about. And we need to be able to have leaders who can articulate a better future, a better vision for that. And this, this uh, diagram sort of illustrates that. So over, over on the left, we'll call that the status quo. That's probably a, a picture of Calcutta. Actually, it's a picture of Ron's house. Well, to be fair, it's his second house. No, uh, well, you know, it's, it's clearly a slum, and nobody would want to live there. The, the, the challenge that leaders have is they have to convince people that their current circumstance can be changed, that there's hope for a better future. Now, the picture on the right, that's a picture of Maui, right? So Maui's, most people agree who've been to Maui, Hawaii would say Maui's a, a pretty nice place to live. So I use those metaphorically that the people living in the slum, you'd think it'd be very easy to convince them to move to Maui. But the fact is, it's not, because there's this mountain in the way, and they can't see Maui. They can't imagine Maui. They can't imagine themselves there until a leader is able to articulate that there's a better future, a better vision for health care, for retirement, for taxes, for growing economies, for creating jobs. When, when uh, leaders do this in a way that's compelling, they begin to shed all their skepticism uh, about their future and start to believe in what this person is saying. They do have to deliver. And then what a leader needs to do is not only maintain the current system to bring people up over the mountain, uh, but to get them to believe that they will all go with them, meaning elect all the people uh, that we want elected uh, to enact the leader's vision. It's a very difficult job. And uh, many politicians, they talk a lot uh, but they don't mean this. And so you really look for leaders who, who understand how to articulate a vision for the future and they would know uh, how to implement it so we can move from, pro from uh, poverty, in this case, uh, to prosperity. So it all starts with a vision. A vision becomes the attracting force uh, that, that's the organizing force. When, we all, when a leader articulates a vision, that's when people, they get people's attention. They say, I want to help this candidate because he's describing the future I want for my children. And so, but you have to have that vision. If you don't have that vision, or if you see a candidate who just can't seem to get a lot of volunteers or people around them, it's probably because they lack a vision. They don't know uh, where, where they want to take the country, 
or, or the office of which their jurisdiction they're going to be in charge of, they don't know how to articulate how things are going to become better. They lack a vision, uh, and therefore they are not an attractive force for people to gather around. So the vision has got to be functionally true that we can, as Ron just showed with the, uh, the Freedom Index, is that if we follow all the rules uh, that we know lead to prosperity and freedom, uh, or follow the rules for freedom, it inevitably leads to prosperity. And we need to be able to show that those things are, are fun functionally true and it doesn't just sound like pie in the sky. So in my next slide, I want to talk about the idea of big ideas. And so I use another metaphor, an example of chip, chipmunks and, and antelopes. A lion, which you see on the right, is a hyper carnivore. A hyper carnivore has to eat large game. So antelopes, giraffe, zebra, these are the things that lions will hunt. Um, if they hunt chipmunks, now they may catch some, they may catch some all day, and the animal will still starve to death because chipmunks aren't enough to sustain uh, a lion. So what do I mean by all that? Leaders have to focus on large scale change. They wanna move and change very large systematic things to get things to change in the system. When they focus on minutia and small uh, things and small ideas, uh, then they're seen as, as not very important. So Ronald Reagan had three big ideas. Uh, one was to crush and defeat the Soviet Union. The second was to reinvigorate the American economy to bring it back to prosperity. And the third literally was to get Americans who had lost faith in our system uh, to believe in themselves again. And those were his three goals. That's all he focused on. Anything else that came wandering into the Oval Office that wasn't one of those three things, he assigned it to somebody else, and that was not what he was gonna focus on. He was only gonna focus on large-scale change of those three things. And because he did that, the Soviet Union, the, although it wants to be, is no longer with us. The uh, American economy came back. We created a record number of jobs under the Reagan administration. Uh, Ron pointed out that he had, was first elected with, with 44 states because he had a big vision and knew how to communicate that vision uh, as an attracting governing philosophy. When he ran again, he won 49 states. So he was overwhelmingly uh, elected. And the American people began to believe in themselves again. I think it was Robert who, who mentioned uh, quite astutely this morning um, that Reagan had this, uh, this idea uh, that we try to uh, talk about things that we have commonalities within ourselves, but we also accept that there, there are differences uh, within, within conservatism. Uh, but we don't focus on those. We focus on the things uh, that we can all agree on. And so he was very concerned about communicating to the American people to believe in themselves as Americans, not as a as what they call a, a nationalistic, which equates to some uh, fascist policy, but know that we have different and separate distinct identities, although we all operate uh, within the framework of a conservative uh, ideology. So the next, next point is once you, once you have a large uh, scale vision, you want to be able to be winning over the public. Make sure that all of your communication is not framed for the elite crowd, yes, for the Brussels crowd, for the elite press, that's not important. We do have to communicate through the press, but we wanna make sure that when people read their stories, that our quotes relate to the voters and that the voters find them important. So don't worry about winning over the Brussels crowd, we never will. Don't worry about winning over the press, we never will. Worry about communicating and winning over the voters, which means we have to speak directly uh, to the voters, and so all of our communication has to be framed uh, literally in, in a choice of two futures. We're, we're always going to start with our positive vision for change. Whenever we have an opportunity to talk to the press, we talk about our positive vision for change. If we have enough time, we tell uh, our voters of why the opposition's uh, status quo is no longer acceptable. So you have to practice, you have to know what you're going to say every single day. You have to practice your, your communication, your speeches when you go on 
uh, to the television or onto the radio, you know exactly how you're going to convince the voters because and every election is really about one word, about one thing, and that's a choice. An election is a choice. Even when people don't vote, that is a choice. 64% uh, of the people voted in Italy yesterday, and for whatever reason, 44% uh, decided not to vote. They made a choice. Uh, not voting is also a choice. And so we have to frame everything in terms of a choice. And so politicians and people who work for the party must constantly be communicating uh, about that choice. So therefore, they, uh, an election uh, campaigning must always be about persuasion. All the communication from, coming from a candidate or the campaign must be uh, geared toward setting that choice for the voter. If you're talking about anything else, and you analyze it later and you say, did that help the voters make a choice? And if it did, then it was good communication. If it did not help the voter to make a choice, then it was wasted communication. Much the same way that you would not uh, run a run an automobile commercial on the television and not use every second of that advertisement to convince people to buy your automobile. That would be a, a a reckless use of money to, to spend words and times and images that do not persuade the customer uh, to buy the, the product. Politicians have limited time also, and they cannot use that time not persuading voters, which, is mean, which means they have to be uh, deliberate uh, and purposeful in, in their communication of how I'm going to win the public. And if you make the right arguments, you're going to win the voter despite the media bias, because if you're quoted accurately, most reporters will quote you accurately. The problem is most politicians talk too much and then they quote the part that the politician didn't want them to quote and not the part that they thought they would quote. So if you want to be quoted saying the thing you wanted to say, just say the thing you wanted to say. And you don't need to say all, that other, all those other things that they would like you to say or try to trap you into saying because it fits their story uh, that their assignment editor assigned them to. Say, no, that's all I want to say about this. And, and make sure that, that that statement gives the voter the choice that you uh, want them to make. So the most important thing is, is to speak first about values. And so I'm going to break down communication in, in basically uh, three different parts. There are values, there are ideas, and there are issues. When we start with issues, we instantly divide the room. So if we talk about anything from property rights to taxes to abortion, um, to any of your, think about your local issues in question, when we go right to that issue and begin talking about it, the room is instantly divided. Some people are for it, some people are against it. I might suggest that, like a good salesperson, when you begin a conversation of persuasion to get them to buy a product, you want the, you want the customer to be saying yes first, right? Yes, now, right, all the endorphins of yes are going, I'm ready to buy, and, and now I can make the pitch. But if instantly half the room is going, no, 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 because of all their biases related to that particular issue, I have no chance to persuade them. I have to put them in the right mood. So I have to say things, uh, for instance, uh, in America we have a social security system. And that's our pension, that's our retirement, that's uh, run uh, horribly by the government. Uh, but people do get a, a social security and it's adequate. It's not, it doesn't even compare if people were allowed to make their own personal investments, they would be far more wealthy, uh, but they get by and they're fine. But if you go into a room with seniors and say, I'd like to talk to you about changing Social Security, the whole room will be against you right away. Not only will it be against you, they might turn violent. They might turn your car over. I don't care if they're in walkers or not. Seniors do not want to talk about changing Social Security. However, if I were in the same room with a group of seniors and said, I, I, you know, Social Security is fine and, and if you're over uh, 50 years of age today, uh, no one's going to change your social security and you'll, be, you'll collect it for the rest of your life. Well, okay, he, he seems all right to me, he doesn't want to take my social security away, he doesn't want to change my social security, uh, he's all right. And then I say, now let's talk about social security for your grandchildren. Don't you think your grandchildren should also have a secure retirement? Now what grandparent would not want their grandchild to have a, social, a secure retirement? So all the heads are saying, yes, of course I want my grandchildren to have a secure retirement and say, now let me talk to you about an idea for younger people that might want to invest, and then I can demonstrate how uh, 
it, how if we kept the social security system the same in America, it will go bankrupt and they will not have social security. No grandparent wants that. Or I can introduce an idea that doesn't include cutting benefits or raising the retirement age, uh, but in fact, in some limited way, younger people might be able to have personal savings accounts. Or we could even start with just the poor people. And that way, we create an argument that th they say, well, you're always, you're always uh, hurting the poor. Okay, well, let's, let's just have the poor have private social security accounts, and we won't even take them off the old social security account. And why would I want to do that? Because over time, people would realize I like having my own account better than I like the government managing an account because it's my money and I can pass it along to my children or my heirs in any which way. So we have to create arguments to fulfill uh, what, what we know will eventually work and get the left to fight against itself, saying, yes, they want to deny people their own uh, private social security accounts. So we, we can do that with education, we can do that with social security, we can do that uh, with many, many things where we design systems that allow the poor to take advantage of, the, of our ideas. And then the poor will argue uh, that they like those ideas. Um, because if young people had a social security account, most people, poor young people, people do not stay poor all their life, particularly in, in the United States. They may be poor when they're younger, but as they get older, they become more prosperous. And then they wouldn't qualify for the personal accounts. And then you'd have a whole large population saying, I like that thing I had when I was poor. Why can't I have that now? So you're creating a systematic change. But you have to do it in a way that's attractive and provides incentive uh, to the voter. So we start on the value level, we go through the idea, and then people are open idea to the issue. But always start uh, first with the value. Let me talk about what those values are, because you might be wondering, there must be more examples of those values. Well, here they are. So these are in no particular order, but they tend to be the same. There are more, and they change from time to time, and they go up and down in the headlines from time to time. So my personal health and safety is usually a number one value, okay? And that has to do with issues like uh, health care, like universal coverage, uh, prescription medicine costs. It also has to do with ideas of foreign policy for, for countries who are uh, sending people to war, their personal their personal safety or being invaded, right? So these would be very important issues because people's health and safety is obviously very important to them. So that's the value. So knowing my retirement years will be secure, their financial security, of course, a better relationship uh, with family, which usually means they can spend more time uh, with their family, which means they have to have the financial resources to be able to spend more, to go on nice vacations, to not have to work two or three jobs, uh, to be together to, so that they can be with their family a more satisfying relationship with God, a better job, better education for my children. That generally speaks to public education. And then being able to afford college for my child. So in the United States, our college tuitions are not free. You have to pay for them. So that's generally private education or a secondary education. Uh, being able to own my own home, uh, being able to enjoy uh, travel and leisure time, which I think uh, speaks for itself. Okay, next slide, please. So Tip O'Neill was an American politician who became Speaker of the House, and he was Speaker of the House of Representatives for a long time. And he liked to say that all politics is local. And I think that's true. But I believe that politics is actually more than local. It, it is personal. So we have to talk to people, not, not as statistics, not as broad uh, general policies, but actually talk to people in their own lives and how things might affect them, which is why we should tell stories about real people uh, and how policies affect them. Remember this, that uh, on our side, on the conservatives, we don't do a terribly good job. Uh, Ron alluded it to it later, so you have the uh, Aristotle's uh, pathos, ethos, and logos, and we're really good at the logos, right? We're really good at rolling out, and you gotta have all three. But we're really good at rolling out the statistics, um, the aggregates, and all of those things. But uh, what the left is really good at is the ethos. They're very good at the emotion. And they're very good at getting people to feel a story. And they do that by telling real stories about real human beings. And the, the reason storytelling is important is because we remember stories. You may not remember the whole speech, but I'll guarantee you if a politician go, told a good story in the speech, you'll be able to go home and repeat that entire story as if you had memorized the speech. Uh, to your spouse or your loved one uh, just by listening to it one time. 
That's remarkable, isn't it? You listen to a story one time and you can actually retell the entire story. Whereas you wouldn't be able to retell the speech with all the statistics and the, and the way government works and all that yada yada blah blah. It sounds like this, wah wah rah, right? But a story connects with the heart. People remember stories that connect with the heart. So we have to talk uh, about stories and we have to make sure that we hit people, we talk to them here. Now, as a conservative, I like to hear things here because I'm very logical, I want to hear the logic. Uh, but most people make their decision not with their head, they make their decision with their hearts. So make sure you're speaking with the heart, using your logic, but speak to the heart. So a campaign is a, as I mentioned, a choice, and therefore all the communication in the campaign must be about one thing, persuasion. We must spend all of our time talking about people to make that choice. Next slide, please. So in order for it to be about uh, persuasion, the campaign uh, must be about really one thing. It has to be about contrast, right? It's contrast, contrast, contrast. Next slide, please. If it, is, if it is not about contrast, the incumbent, the person who's already in the office today, if you're the challenger campaign and your campaign cannot demonstrate what is different about you or how life will be different or how the country will be different or how the education system or whatever the topic is, if you cannot demonstrate how your policies or, or your experience is going to change that for voters, then they will do what? They will elect, re-elect the incumbent every single time. They will not fire somebody unless they know that the, the, the other choice uh, is better. There are some cases where the voters will be angry enough to fire someone, but that's not a good strategy relying on voter anger to win election after ele election. We have to create a positive vision for change that people want and desire so much and be able to communicate that in an effective way that is different from the opponent that they can't say, oh, me too, I want that too. Oh, me too, I want that too. And even sometimes when they say that, if you've said it first and established your identity in that change, then they become the me too candidate and that's not good enough. Uh, but don't ever allow them to say, oh, I'm doing that already. Make sure that you're talking about things that they voted against, about a vision that they don't support. Um, and so we, we must demonstrate contrast in the campaign. It's absolutely critical. So in order to set the contrast, we, we have to frame what the choice is all about. It's going to set the whole theme for the campaign, and it creates the debate. Why do I want to debate? Because I want the news media to cover my campaign. And a news media has a really hard time covering a campaign if you're really no different from your opponent. But if you're constantly setting a contrast and framing a debate with your opponent, that is interesting to the media and they will pay attention to it or you have a better chance of them paying attention to it. You've got to be able to demonstrate that your contrast and your ideas are going to make the life of the voters better. Uh, better. And, and the central theme is it's a struggle really for the voter's mind. You want to get them to ask a question when they go to the voting booth. And Reagan had a very good question. His question was actually, the answer was in the negative. It's better if it's in the positive, but his was very effective. And he simply asked one question. He says, are, are you better off today than you were four years ago when you first ran against uh, Jimmy Carter? And the fact was most Americans were not better off. They were far worse off than when Jimmy Carter became president. And so his simple question got people to ask, is my life better than it was before? No, it is not better. And therefore, I will vote for Ronald Reagan because I would like to have change. And so that was his central theme, uh, and it worked uh, quite well. Next slide, please. So we're thinking about a message, and how do we find, I've been talking about the contrast um, and that it's important. So how do we find this message? How do we find what's gonna resonate with the voter? Because generally, you may be strong on an issue, but if your opponent is equally strong about the issue and frankly has no uh, disagreement with you over the issue, that's probably not a strong, that's probably not your best thing to run on. We wanna find the areas to run on where your opponent is weak uh, and that the voters want change. So your message is found in a triangle of ice. Ice being the incumbent, the one you're running against, challenger, and the electorate. It is the likes and dislikes of the electorate 
with the strengths and weaknesses of the challenger uh, and the incumbent, incumbent, and incumbent. So you list all these things. You list all the weaknesses of the incumbent, but be sure to list their strengths too, because you want to know where the areas. You do not want to get into a debate with your with your opponent uh, when they are strong in in a particular area where you're not. You want to be debating your opponent where you are strong and you have a strong track record on an issue where your opponent is weak. And then you have to know: Do the opponent, do the voters? fall on my side of the argument or they fall on my opponent's side of the argument. So you want to pick issues where most of the voters, a good majority of the voters, I, don't, I wouldn't pick 50-50 issues, then you have too much work and it's too expensive uh, to, to persuade people, to educate people. We don't, we don't have time to educate people on the campaigns. We only have time to win. So we want to make sure we pick issues where a, a healthy majority of voters agree with us on the issue and disagree with the opponent. So where we're strong on the issue, they're weak on the issue, and the voters agree with us. Those are, those are the issues in which you want to develop uh, campaign theme messages about. Um, this recently happened uh, in my state of Virginia. Virginia has been a swing state, has been trending toward the Democrats for quite some time. The Democrats have held the governor's office, and we had a candidate named Glenn Youngkin who ran on education, and in the United States, the, our, the conservatives have done very poorly on education, and the liberals have done very well on education. Well, the liberals had so botched education that when we got the right, when we had the right message with the right candidate explaining how the left was hurting education for our children, which is exactly what Glenn Youngkin was doing, he beat uh, Terry McAuliffe, who was not only a former governor for the state, uh, he was also the DNC chairman, so he was a political operative. He was a very sophisticated candidate, uh, and, we, and we, he made some mistakes, but we beat him on a central issue that was core to the Democrats' uh, education. And so that's a really good, that's a really good sign, because, because Glenn knew how to make education, his vision for education, uh, an attractive vision, which people said, we don't want the other part, which is the left is teaching all kinds of things in our classrooms, other than math, reading, and science, and the things we send our children to get educated about. They were teaching about all these social values uh, that conservatives, frankly, will like to teach their children those values at home. And so that, that became a central theme uh, of the campaign. So he found his message in this triangle of ice. You can find your messages in the same triangle. Create controversy in a campaign. Why would I want to create controversy in my campaign? Well, you want to do that is because when you create a controversy in a campaign, you, you encourage the media to cover the campaign. Uh, as I said before, uh, the media has a very hard time covering campaigns that are just boring and nobody's doing anything different and everybody agrees with everybody else and it's just a nice contest between people with different last names. No, you create controversy in a campaign uh, where we, we are defining our positive vision for change, we are contrasting that against the status quo of the incumbent, and we attack the incumbent. And one thing we don't do very well is every, every public policy, every public policy has a victim. The left is really good at, at identifying the victim, what they call the victims of the conservative public policy. Uh, we never seem to identify the victims of their public policy uh, but the victims of their public policy uh, are in mass graves. I mean, I can point to them, and yet we somehow can't even point that out. I mean, the victims of uh, socialism uh, has been uh, pretty deadly uh, over the last century, and yet we can't point out that socialism over and over again uh, leads to killing people. And uh, we never seem to point out, to point out that that their policies lead to poverty. Their policies lead to less freedom. Their policies uh, lead to less, less choice, less prosperity, um, worse education, worse health care. Uh, uh, and yet it seems so easy to me that we should be winning those arguments and yet we lose them because we don't know how to set the contrast, we don't know how to describe our policies in a visionary positive way, and we don't know how to point out the victims of their, of their public policy. Next slide, please. So in order to do that effectively, we've got to practice. We've got to be able to communicate uh, persuasively through all types of media. Now, 
you may get a 30 minute speech. Great, I can develop a speech that would be very persuasive for people to understand. Uh, but sometimes I only get five minutes. Maybe I'm doing an introduction or maybe I only get five minutes at the podium. Um, I've been generously allotted somewhere close to an hour, so I get a lot of time to be persuasive with you all. But if, we're on, if we're on, I were on TV, I might get one minute, or a radio interview, I might get one minute, I might get 30 seconds, so I, or even 10 seconds. So I have to be able to explain in those 10 seconds the same message that I would get in the 30 seconds. So I have to be very disciplined uh, about my message. Uh, one one uh, person and peoples that I've begun to watch very closely and admire is, is the Ukrainians, uh, and President Zelensky, I have watched him repeatedly, uh, been on, he's always on message. He, he is always convincing the West that this is your war, that we need more help, and he's always, he never misses an opportunity and the, what the Russians are doing, and he calls, he calls out the Russians uh, over and over and over again, and they never miss an opportunity to, to be persuasive. So, uh, yeah, they may be winning the military war, but you know what, they're, they're also winning the communications war. Very strongly, they're winning the communications war. Putin is losing the communications war uh, quite badly. Next slide, please. So, if you're in, if you're in politics, it probably comes as no surprise to you that we have to deal with conflict. <laughs> so we have to get comfortable uh, dealing with conflict uh, because conflict leads to, remember I said when we talk to a room, we wanna get people, everyone agreeing, right? And then the room, if we start with the issues, everybody divides. Well, eventually we're all gonna divide because we're gonna to go to the vote, voting booths and some people are gonna vote for this set of candidates and some are gonna vote for those set of candidates. Um, so conflict in, in politics is unavoidable. It's just how you deal with that conflict and use it uh, to your advantage to get people to understand what the choice really, that's all it is. It's understanding what the choice is all about. It's about two futures. It's about one vision or another vision or one vision and no vision, but make sure you're at least on the side that has some vision of what the future uh, is like. And so we need good ideas that other people are going to oppose. We are going to present good ideas and people are going to oppose them. Why are they gonna oppose them? Because their policies are going to be swept away. Um, the people who, even people who perhaps are getting rich on their policies, those people are not gonna get rich anymore, right? So you introduce a good idea, yes, you have victims of your policy. It may be in, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, a wealthy person who's collecting all this money because of a government program, uh, legally or not, it may, uh, but they don't want the program to change. They've, that's how they got rich. Uh, but that public that policy might be bad, and probably is bad, for the majority of people. So we'll sweep it away, and we'll also sweep away the person who's making all the money. So they are going to fight back. They're not going to go easily, uh, but we must be uh, prepared for that. We have to talk about uh, being on the majority side. We have to talk about our victim side. We're on the side of the 80%. We understand that 20% don't agree with us, but the 80% certainly do. So when you are attacked, make sure that you uh, get on, that you respond to the attack if appropriate. Uh, if in fact someone attacks you and there's no chance anyone's going to hear it, it doesn't do you any good to defend yourself in public because then you're just giving uh, more coverage to the attack. But however, if you are attacked and it becomes public and you know, spend as little time as you can defending yourself, but then get on the offense again and go back to reframing. What happens to too many politicians is they get attacked, they wanna defend their honor, and they, they get bogged down in just defending themselves, defending, and suddenly they're not talking about their strengths and the opponent's weaknesses, they're talking about their weaknesses and the opponent's strengths. So I, I can't remember my triangle of ice, I have to go back to talking about my strengths and the opponent's weaknesses. So I wanna defend myself and then quickly move to areas of the campaign where I'm strong and the incumbent's weak and frames the choice once again for the voters what the, what the election is all about and not what the opponent would like the, the election uh, to be about. So you have to use conflict, novelty, scandal, uh, just ways of getting uh, of news coverage so that people will pay attention uh, to the race. And when you do that, uh, we, we do something at the end of um, campaigns is we do an ID poll. So we'll 
call people up at the end of the campaign and do a poll, a poll to figure out who's going to vote for our candidate, who's going to vote for their candidate. And if you do an ID poll and they've heard nothing about you, uh, that information is going to be useless because you'll get back, you know, do, will you vote for candidate A, Rick Tyler, or will you vote for candidate B, Tom Brown? And if, and if no one's heard of me, then they'll say, I don't know, or maybe Tom Brown. So you get terrible data. If, by the, if you've done all, everything correctly in a campaign and you've created the contrast and people like your vision and they, they've, they've heard your name, they like your vision, uh, then they hear your name. Uh, then they say, yes, I will vote for Rick Tyler. Now I'm going to make sure that that person actually shows up to the polls because saying they're going to vote for me is not good enough. I have to make sure they actually go uh, to the polls. And so I'll get a very good voter ID poll. I'll have lots of good data that I can use to push people out to the polls. But if I don't do my job during the campaign, I'm going to have very f little to push people, a very few names to push uh, to the polls. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. One, one important thing to understand is when we're, when we're speaking to the voter or any audience, um, they don't necessarily have our mindset, right? Because you're all here uh, because you are actively involved, because you care about the issues, because you care about freedom, because you care about your country uh, or your neighborhoods and your, your communities. That's not to say that other Croatians don't care about their, those things. They just don't have the level of involvement and activity uh, that you do that you want to make a difference. So we have to understand what they're thinking when we communicate them to them. So any audience, whether we're on television, we, we need to know who our audience is, whether we're speaking to them in person, whether they're watching a particular uh, news channel or listening to a particular radio station. We want to understand the demographic, who listens to this show, so that I can communicate in a way that's persuasive uh, to them. Um, so I don't want to start out with premises they instantly disagree with. I want to use phrases that gets me to get them to listen that yes, while well, well, we can all agree that we should have a better retirement system, uh, let me share with you some of the statistics or some of the ideas or the victims of the current retirement system and why it's not working. And let me give you an idea of how it could do better. And then we're opening people's minds up. So you have to understand uh, what it is they believe before you communicate and you must transfer into their world. Uh, where they live. Perhaps they're of a different socioeconomic class. Perhaps they're of a different ethnic background. Perhaps they're of a different religion. Uh, know what it is and what's important to them so you will know how to communicate in ways that you will connect with them that you show that you care about uh, the same values, even though you may have different solutions. But they'll be open to the solutions if you connect uh, on the values. Next slide, please. Okay, so to demonstrate this, I'll use two circles. This one, this would be my life. This is my life, represents my life. The next one represents the life uh, of, or within my life, politics, politics and issues in my life, right? So that's, that's, I'll get to it. Okay, next, that's the voter's life. Politics and issues in their life, are very small. Okay, my life and probably yours, the voter's life. Now, if you're like me, if you, if you are like me, get help, get help. This is, this is, this is not healthy, <laughs> right? And, and if you, if, if, you, because we're different. We're not like most people, right? Okay? And if you need evidence of it, <clears throat> you're spending four days here with us instead of doing things normal people do, like watch the soccer game, right? Like, Go out and, enjoy, and walk in the park, uh, be with family, go on picnics, uh, go to work. No, you're all here in a room, right, listening to us because, because you care enough uh, to allow others to do that. Do you understand? They, so they can thank you, right, because you're protecting freedom. They have the freedom now to do what they want. And we're going to be here to make sure that they can continue to do what we want. The only difference is we want more of them to come into the room and help us to protect the, everyone else's uh, freedom. So, but understand that we are like this and they're like that. So speak to them, not like we speak to each other, speak to them like they speak to each other. They don't talk about all the issues. They, they do talk about, I'm not making enough money. I can't pay all my bills. My child's education is not good enough. I, I'm worried about saving money for my child's uh, college or education. I'm worried about my parents' Uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease and taking care of them. Those are things uh, we can talk to them about. But if we talk about macro policy, economics, uh, we're not going to connect with them. Okay, next slide. 
All right. So we have to stay on message, as I said before. We don't have the luxury to go off and talk about anything we want to. We have to be persuasive uh, to, to frame the choice about all the time. We have to be proactive. Uh, like any chess game, we must predict and preempt. And getting punched is, is one thing, or throwing a punch is one thing against your opponent. The counterpunch is much uh, more persuasive. Uh, that particularly works in debates. So we have to be ready. Yes, we're going to get hit, but it's how are we going to hit back? And when we hit back harder to make an impact, so people don't remember how we got punched, they just remember how we counterpunched. Okay, so we're always ready. And visuals uh, abs absolutely matter. So here are two pictures. Uh, that's uh, George uh, W. Bush on the left, and that's John Kerry, uh, who wanted to be president and never ended up being president. And now he's some, uh, uh, what is he, a climate czar. Um, and... Uh, my apologies for John Kerry. You may see him in your neighborhood from time to time whining about the climate. But anyway, so this picture, uh, George Bush, fully in command, in control. His eyes are laser focused. He's confident. He's pointing where he's going to throw the ball. Uh, John Kerry apparently thinks that catching an American football is best done by closing your eyes. Um, it doesn't work very well. And he looks sort of buffoonish there. And that's the image we wanted to portray. And so in those... Uh, visual images uh, work quite well. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, the, the, the party and the movement, uh, and certainly uh, Stephen has this job because he has an important uh, position, is that we have to plan not just for what we're going to do tomorrow. The way we know what we're going to do tomorrow is because we know where we want to be in five to eight years. When we understand where we want to be in five to eight years, what, what are our strategic goals? Uh, both politically and policy-wise. And what are we doing? Uh, how are we going to get there? What would be an acceptable goal in the, f in the first couple of years? And we ha when we have that all mapped out, I know what I'm going to do tomorrow morning because I have all those projects uh, lined out. But we have to be thinking ahead. We can't just go day to day. We have to be thinking long term. Uh, and that's how we create political movements. And we have to train our activists to be patient. Everybody wants the results in Italy. We swap the government overnight. And everything's going to be wonderful. No, it's not. It's going to take time. Um, and we have, to we have to train our activists to stay patient and dedicated and persevere, and then we will get there. Okay, next slide, please. So we have to design uh, policies that reinforce our, our point uh, over time, and we have to think about technological changes in the future. These, these things are happening. As Ron pointed out, we went from... Uh, a bicycle to high-performance vehicle uh, within two generations. We went from uh, expected age expectancy uh, somewhere in the low 40s uh, to um, over 70 years old in a very relatively short period of time. Uh, we are still in the midst of that change. Um, I was, we were in um, Tallinn the other day, and we watched a robot deliver. Uh, I don't know what they were delivering, but they were delivering a it could have been pizza, it could have been an Amazon order, but it was going across the sidewalk in the middle of the city. A robot um, was delivering packages. Uh, so this automation, that's going to happen with, with cars eventually. Uh, there will be driverless cars. Apple is developing one today. What, what kind of public policy Im impact is that going to have? I will say that traditionally the left has been, they call themselves progressive, but that's not their history actually. Their history is to preserve the status quo, which is they had a very difficult time moving to new um, technologies. Uh, uh, ride shares like Bolt and Uber uh, very much upset the left, um, but they survived because the customer wanted them. We had the same problems in the United States. The left was very much against these innovations as they were against the railroads. Uh, as they were against all the innovations that seem to come, they're always worried about how it's going to affect the, their status quo. Uh, but we need to anticipate and understand how the future is going to change. Sometimes it's positive and sometimes it's negative, but the future is going to happen. Uh, so we just need to be prepared for it and design our strategies to fit uh, the innovations. How do you follow innovations? You know, follow entrepreneurs, follow people who are creating the future. What are they creating? And think about the pol public policy impacts that they are going to have. Next slide, please. Uh, solutions work, right? So talk about voters don't care about process. So you all been to a fast food restaurant. You don't order the food and say, uh, oh, I'd like a hamburger. So 
uh, tell the chef to put it on the grill and then flip it over and then put it on the bun, right? Now you don't tell them any of that, right? Because they know how to do their work and they, they so you're not worried about the process. Uh, people don't understand, um, they don't worry about the process about traffic planning, but when people are in traffic and they can't get to work on time, are they concerned about traffic? You, absolutely, they're concerned about pro traffic. And they expect it to work, just as we expect our sound systems to work, we expect our computers to work, we expect our smartphones to work, we, we expect the airlines, we expect many, many things to work. And when they don't work, you create the delta uh, the difference between how the private sector works often and how the public uh, sector works. And so we have to be uh, conscious about we need to create solutions that are not government-centric. And, and one of the problems with, and we have to think about this, I think, very deeply, is what the press always says is the left has a solution and the right has no solution. Did you ever hear that before? Oh, well, the left has proposed this, they propose that, and the right, they offer nothing. Well. To some degree, they're right, because the left has, of course, introduced another big trillion dollar government program, right? Uh, 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 or maybe you won't have trillion dollar programs here, but you'll maybe have billion dollar programs. Uh, but the left has this government solution, and so they look like they have a solution and an answer, but all they have is just more big government. Whereas we're saying, no, the solution is in the private sector. And so there is no government solution for it. So it looks so the press likes to say that we have no, no solution uh, at all. Thank you. Uh, so learn the language of solutions. As my friend Joe Gerlord said, if a customer wants a cheeseburger, give him a cheeseburger and not a lecture uh, on nutrition. Next slide, please. So think about, as summing up, the ideal fight that you want to pick has 80% public support. So we need to, that means we need to frame our issues. So, some, one issue framed the wrong way may have 50% support. But the same issue framed another way may have 80% support. So make sure you're getting your framing of your issue and the choice uh, correctly before you start arguing something that doesn't seem very popular. It might be popular, it perhaps is framed the wrong way. Uh, then we want to put uh, our policies on the victim side. What are the things that are happening now uh, that the status quo is hurting people and how can we fix them? And we must point out uh, real stories with real people, uh, they have to be validated by allies. We're not going to win uh, anything ourselves, just ourselves. We have to find out who the stakeholders are, who share our values, who want uh, the same changes we do, and activate them so they're communicating those very same uh, changes. We want something that uh, matters to me and my family, and we want something that we can easily uh, repeat over and over again. Um, so with that, I'll take questions. Any questions? No questions. I've answered all of your questions. <laughs>